It's my very great pleasure to welcome you to the Caldor Centre for International Refugee Laws Annual Conference. My name is Jane McAdam and I'm the Director of the Caldor Centre. At the outset, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Our ambition, our ambition for this virtual conference was to bring people together for a truly global event to discuss the big issues that will face the refugee protection regime in the years ahead as we come to grips with the far reaching implications of COVID-19. Indeed, COVID-19 is the reason why we're holding the conference as a virtual event for the first time. The advantage of that though, is that we have hundreds of people joining us from all over the world, nearly 50 countries and a dazzling lineup of speakers. Over the next four days, we will grapple with some of the biggest issues that will shape the protection agenda in the years to come. How do we defend human rights in the face of nationalism, misinformation and mistrust? How is technology transforming the landscape for refugees and other people on the move? And how can we harness technology in a way that respects rather than risks human rights? How do racism and displacement intersect and is it time for the refugee protection regime's own Black Lives Matter moment? I would of course like to thank our conference sponsors who've helped make it all possible. The law firms Gail, Veres, Hall and Wilcox, Slater and Gordon, and Watton and Kearney. And I would also like to acknowledge Andrew and Renata Caldor, whose generous support over the past seven years has enabled the Caldor Centre to, tra to transform from an idea alone into a leading research centre. In this panel called The Decade Ahead, Defending Protection and People on the Move, we welcome four experts who have first-hand experience in the protection of people who are displaced, whether within their own countries, across international borders, because of conflict or persecution, disasters, the impacts of climate change or other humanitarian crises. Together, we're going to explore the big issues in displacement that will face us in the next decade. How are people going to find safety when borders are closing and populist politics are flaming xenophobia and intolerance? Where are the solutions? And how can refugee and local communities, international actors and humanitarian organisations respond? We're going to have 40 minutes of a moderated discussion between our panellists, followed by some time for questions from the audience. You can submit your questions at any time through the Q&A tab on your screen, and you can vote on questions that you like. We'll try to get through as many of them as we can. Immediately after this panel, there'll be an opportunity for an interactive discussion in our first breakout session of the conference. There you'll be able to turn on your cameras and microphones and delve into a deeper discussion about the issues arising from this panel. That discussion will be ably facilitated by Dr. Marianne Lockrey, who is a member of the Caldor Centre's Advisory Committee and has a wealth of experience in policy, research and advocacy in this area. The breakout session will take place in a separate Zoom meeting. You'll find the link to it in the chat and you can click through to that link once this session concludes. So I now have the great pleasure of introducing our four speakers, whose full biographies can, can of course be found on the conference website. Louise Aubin is the regional representative for UNHCR in Australia, New Zealand and the Pacific. And she has more than 25 years of legal policy and humanitarian experience, including in large scale emergencies around the world. She led the UN's global protection cluster and as UNHCR's deputy director for international protection, she developed policies with a focus on children, gender, education and community based programs. Rez Gardi is an international lawyer and human rights activist who was born in a refugee camp in Pakistan. She was eventually resettled with her family in New Zealand. Rez was Young New Zealander of the Year in 2017 and won a Fulbright scholarship to study her Master of Law at Harvard University. She's currently working in Kurdistan in Northern Iraq as a Harvard Satter Human Rights Fellow. Cecilia Jimenez de Mari is a human rights and international humanitarian law expert. She has over three decades of experience in human rights advocacy for the Asia Pacific region. And since 2016, she has been the UN Special Rapporteur 
on the human rights of internally displaced persons. Kathleen Newland is a senior fellow and co-founder of the Migration Policy Institute in Washington, DC. Uh, she focuses on the governance of international migration, on the relationship between migration and development, and on refugee protection. Kathleen previously co-directed the International Migration Policy Program at the Carnegie Endowment, and she taught international political economy at the London School of Economics. So welcome everybody. Louise, I'll begin with you, and I'd like to ask you this question. Prior to the COVID-19 pandemic, we'd already seen a rise in literal and figurative barricades to movement. What are some of the policies that are blocking access to protection? And how do you see these playing out in the coming years, especially if emergency public health laws become baked in, as UNHCR's Assistant High Commissioner for Protection has put it? Mm. It's an interesting uh, question, Jane, and you're, you're right to point to the before and now, uh, because when we think of those policies that are currently, or the impact of policies that are currently, you know, challenging the protection of refugees or asylum seekers uh, now, we have to go back to some of the pre-existing conditions here. Um, we had, uh, in the not too distant past um, agreed almost universe, universally, you know, uh, there was a reaffirmation of global solidarity around the very basic tenets of, of protection and the global compact on refugees went a step further um, and really reminded us all that, um, you know, beyond states, but including states, there needs to be, um, you know, a much more robust effort um, to, to protecting uh, refugees and asylum seekers, given a bit of a standstill when we were talking about progress in terms of finding solutions or the really the, those things that really effectively protect people in transit while they're moving, but also when they're reaching asylum. And um, uh, so, you know, with restricted movements now, uh, given the pandemic and some of the poli new policies that are emerging, you know, from a um, uh, public health uh, concern. We're seeing, you know, anxieties that once were expressed in terms of national security or these amalgamations uh, that are made around asylum and refugees uh, from a security perspective now transformed into a similar narrative but spun around public health concerns and anxieties. So limitations of movement um, granted are, are legitimate to be able to protect uh, the space and buy us time to be able to identify those at risk and set up, you know, proper responses. But at the same time, we've seen that um, being, you know, uh, put in place without um, any regard for those exceptions, exceptions that have always been at the very core of uh, the asylum system. It's legitimate for sovereign countries to determine who comes in uh, and who people are who are going to who are destined to stay on the territory. And at the same time, exceptions have always been at the very core of um, uh, asylum, meaning there needs to be an exception for those seeking protection. And we have and always have had for um, for decades um, at least systems well in place and expertise to be able to identify those at risk. And this plays out and can play out in terms of um, public health concerns. But what we've seen are, you know, suddenly, um, you know, whatever we've acquired in terms of expertise and experience to be able to identify people at risk, we've put that to the side. And many countries, most countries have actually adopted these blanket policies to just block access. We've seen some dramatic situations playing out, which also, you know, make us question whether or not these uh, tried and true policies and principles of asylum have had really taken hold. Refugees who were uh, legally um, moving to see a family member in a third country, etc., and who have a legal right to re-enter a country of asylum, were suddenly stranded. Um, with you know um, the impossibility of being able to return, 
seemingly under the guise of public health concerns. I mean, those things we had to sort out. Luckily, the solution there was a lot of cooperation between countries and a little bit of pressure being exerted. I think it's important that um, uh, uh, we also recognize that the pandemic has also revealed defunding some services from public health services, which now challenge the very notion of inclusion of everyone in public services to be able to protect everyone. So the need to include refugees, asylum seekers, or actually anyone without a legal status needs to still be included in public health efforts to be able to protect the whole population. But we've also seen, you know, this is also revealed that chronically underfunded or under-resourced services like refugee status determination systems have stalled now some of the progress that had been uh, achieved in terms of tackling, you know, waiting times to determine refugee status, etc. So, um, and I've not yet even touched upon what it's done to um, the resettlement efforts that were underway uh, worldwide. We had increased this um, willingness of many countries to grow quotas to accept refugees referred by UNHCR globally and with a stall on, or a pause on global movements and access to territory. This has also stalled uh, the movement of refugees desperately in need of resettlement as probably the, the life-saving solution in their case. Luckily, we've seen a few now and more recently, a bit of an opening in terms of accepting the most critical or urgent resettlement cases here in uh, Australia, in New Zealand, and in, in, in the region here. But uh, much more needs to be done to be able to reaffirm and reassure government that we have what it takes, both in terms of expertise and in experience, to be able to allow once again that exceptional pathway, which is you know, the entry of asylum seekers, to be able to determine who is in need, who is in need of, of protection. So policies, yes, but the practical implications of those policies over time, we're really seeing this playing out now, and it's a real challenge to go back to the principles that we we thought were so modern just a couple of years ago when we reaffirmed the global compact on refugees. Thank you, Louise. That, that's an incredible overview and I think gives a, uh, an indication of the scope of what, what we're dealing with here. Kathleen, if I might just turn now to you, we've just witnessed an extraordinary election campaign in the US uh, where you're based. Your organisation, the Migration Policy Institute, released a report earlier this year, documenting more than 400 executive actions that the Trump administration had taken, or that Trump had taken in his first four years, as, or, sorry, in his four years as president, spanning everything from border and interior enforcement to refugee resettlement in the asylum system, to the immigration courts and to visa processes. With President-elect Biden, the rhetoric will change significantly but I wonder how much policy change do you think we will see on the ground and how quickly? Um, you know, for instance, I understand that a lot of support services for refugees and others were disbanded as a consequence of changes wrought by the Trump administration. And these sorts of things can take a long time to be reestablished. So I guess, do you think the US is going to revert to a pre-Trump era or are we likely to see a new vision over the longer term and what's this going to mean for the international protection regime as a whole? Thank you, Jane. It's really a pleasure to be with you all, even if only virtually. I think there are uh, two big challenges uh, for the incoming Biden administration when it comes to uh, humanitarian protection. Uh, one uh, that I think many people are focused on is the one you mentioned, which is undoing many of those 400 executive actions of the Trump administration, which have so drastically curtailed uh, refugee protection uh, slash by slashing refugee resettlement uh, admissions um, to historic lows and have thrown up nearly insurmountable obstacles to asylum seekers. 
uh, through a variety of means from uh, rewriting guidance to uh, asylum officers and immigration judges to transforming relations with Mexico and Central American governments on asylum, as well as immigration and uh, stepping up uh, deportations, as, as well as uh, trying to offshore uh, protections, although offshoring is maybe not quite the right term since uh, it's happening across a land border rather than uh, across the seas. There hasn't been much legislation here uh, during the Trump administration and executive actions can be undone by executive action. But the, the Trump uh, administration's actions were so extensive, so complex and so interlocking that it is not going to be easy <clears throat> to unwind them entirely. Uh, they have worked through executive orders, through policy guidance, through regulatory changes across many departments of government. So it is going to be a, a monumental task. Uh, the, the second big challenge in along with that and a, a longer term one <clears throat> is to modernize an immigration and protection system that almost everyone all across the political spectrum recognizes as broken. Uh, so all both of these tasks are complicated, of course, immensely by the coronavirus pandemic and the economic uh, crisis that has resulted. So what can we expect from, from the Biden administration? I think they will start with some low hanging fruit. That is things that um, can be accomplished uh, fairly quickly uh, without much procedure. Uh, and that includes things like um, stopping construction of the wall along the Southern border, raising the refugee resettlement ceiling from the uh, historic low of, of 15,000 for fiscal year 2021 to 125,000 for fiscal year 22, 2022. As you, as you mentioned, Jane, um, there is going to have to be a lot of rebuilding uh, as a result of the Trump administration cutting down on uh, refugee resettlement. But I think the, um, the resettlement organizations and the people who have worked in them are, are eager to spring back into that task and have really tried to preserve as much capacity as possible. Um, I think um, uh, uh, President-elect Biden has already said that he uh, will institute a moratorium on deportations during the pandemic. Um, but I, I think, um, you know, with, and, and that he will um, change the guidance to asylum officers and immigration judges who have been told, you know, in the past few years to just not let anyone in. Um, but there are some real obstacles to uh, the new administration being able to accomplish these things. Uh, I've mentioned already the complexity uh, of the, the actions to be undone. One of the ones that is very much on my mind is the prospect of a rush to the border uh, from Central America uh, in anticipation of a more lenient uh, asylum and, and uh, refugee policy. And if we see uh, um, a lot of, you know, caravans, if we see this big rush to the border and scenes of chaos, there is nothing more guaranteed to undermine uh, the effort to reinstitute a, a humane uh, protection policy. So it will be very important. And I think the Biden transition uh, staff are aware of this to um, make sure that order and a humane approach are, are compatible to show that, they're, that they are compatible. The other, um, other obstacles that I see are uh, that simply that they, a question of priority, they're going to have to give and, and certainly will give priority to uh, dealing with the pandemic and the economic crisis. And this 
raises the question of just bandwidth, you know, how much uh, time and uh, personnel and thought are they going to be able to throw at these issues in the first instance. I think it is high on, on the um, administrations, the incoming administrations uh, list of priorities, but not the highest. So we will have to uh, have a little bit of patience. Um, but I think in the long term, they are determined to build a, a fit for purpose 21st century protection system in the US to restore US leadership uh, in refugee protection on the global stage and to cooperate with other countries, which is something that we have not seen. Um, the result of all that one hopes is that they will um, be able to reinstitute a system that treats immigration and refugee protection as an asset to the United States, uh, which would be a dramatic turnaround from the Trump administration's view of immigration as a social and economic and security threat. Thanks. Thank you, Kathleen. Um, Cecilia, if I could turn to you, there are almost twice as many internally displaced persons or IDPs in the world than there are refugees, as there are refugees, but at times it does feel as though their concerns get obscured. Why do you think this is? And what are the big challenges facing IDPs around the world today? And how similar or distinct are they from those facing refugees? Thank you so much, Jane, for the invitation. Thank you for um, everybody who are here. Um, thanks for that uh, question. Um, the numbers do speak for themselves, don't they? And while refugees, migrants, even international migrants and internally displaced persons all have common and particular protection concerns, those of IDPs are usually marginalized in the general international discourse and their translation into international policies. Moreover, um, from the beginning, I felt that the spectrum of mobility would usually turn, be turned a blind eye to um, by the fact it's particularly the fact that refugees, migrants, they even have actually been internally displaced persons in their own countries, mainly due to the failure of states to protect them. And I've seen this in many of the countries I've been to. Um, so yes, IDPs are usually seen what I would call, unfortunately, a poor cousin. And uh, despite the broad description definition provided by the guiding principles on internal displacement, which is, has been endorsed by the United Nations, many member states are still reluctant to acknowledge, first of all, the existence of internal displacement in their own respective jurisdictions and reticent to assume, even if they have or not, reticent to assume the primary and sovereign responsibility for the human rights of internally displaced persons, seeing internal displacement as a bad thing, which it's not necessarily. It is important to ensure that national polities, you know, the whole uh, uh, social, uh, society, the whole society and the effective populations themselves should assert the human rights of IDPs as part of the broad citizenry and that these are asserted at the national and local levels to hold their governments accountable. The international community must, of course, do more to support that when that happens and facilitate conditions for that. Moreover, for those countries that do acknowledge internal displacement and protection of uh, human rights uh, challenges of their own IDPs, the United Nations and international community must step up on their assistance as needed at both multilateral and bilateral contexts. Um, you also asked a question about the IDPs themselves. Well, there is a whole range of uh, humanitarian assistance needs. And just looking at the guiding principles of the internal displacement, you can see there are litany of all of these human rights that are impacted by internal displacement by the fact they are forcibly displaced. And of course, we need to emphasize protection. At the same time, many of their human rights as internally displaced persons would also be directly impacted by the reasons they were forcibly displaced armed conflict, generalized violence, effects of natural hazards, development projects. And of course, this is within the jurisdictions of their own country. They're not abroad, for example, which would be the case 
for um, refugees and international migrants who may have their own um, protection uh, needs and regimes for protection. And as well, I, certain uh, IDPs may be characterized by their rights as minorities, for example, uh, in indigenous peoples, children, women, men, persons with disabilities, all, all of these groups need particular attention uh, because of their particular characteristics. And, um, and so we're, we're talking here about this whole range of humanitarian and human rights uh, that they that need to be guaranteed. But aside from this, um, to, to, to maybe to, to make sure we, we conclude on the right note, I would like to continue to advocate, and many people are advocating this, that the responses to which, uh, which need to be given by the state, the UN, and with the multilar, multilateral, um, multi-stakeholder approach has to be the vision to facilitate durable solutions for the internally displaced persons, be it return, local integration, or settlement elsewhere in the country, but underlined by voluntary consent, dignity, and full information so that they can be normal, productive citizens again. You know, I mean, you just think about all of the, the um, I, I would say, the, not really the ways, but the potential that need to be stepped up on having internally displaced persons as productive citizens once more of the society. And these need to be tapped. And underlining all of these, is of course the participation of internally displaced persons themselves, which is really, really essential because otherwise there will be no ownership by the people affected themselves and these will not be um, long-term and visionary. Thank you. Thank you, Cecilia. And I, I think that leads perfectly into a question actually that I wanted to pose to Rez. Rez, you're currently living in Kurdistan, where it is actually 3.30 in the morning. So thank you once again for joining us at that hour. In the context in which you find yourself, and I guess more broadly, what do you see as the role of displaced communities in advancing their own rights? And do you think that their voices have been or are being sufficiently heard? Um, and that was my pipiha or a way of introducing myself in Māori, the indigenous language of New Zealand. Uh, although I've returned uh, to Kurdistan, uh, which is my homeland and where my parents originally fled from due to persecution, New Zealand will always be my home. Um, so yeah, uh, Jane, I'm currently on the ground and working in refugee camps and internally displaced camps across the Kurdistan region of Iraq. Um, and I think the current COVID-19 pandemic has uh, really shown us that the risks are ex exacerbated uh, for vulnerable populations ar around the glo uh, globe, especially those living in um, camps. Um, it has really shone a light on inherent uh, inequities from access to information to healthcare services, but it's revealed to us what we've known for um, many years. And that is that refugees, um, displaced people, especially young people are really capable, innovative and ready. Um, and what, what I've seen on the ground directly um, is that, you know, while in many locations, NGOs um, that typically distribute aid or food or non-food items or uh, monitor the protection situation, monitor program activities and conduct outreach in um, urban and camp refugee situations, uh, what they've had to do is restrict a lot of the movement of their national and international staff as a result of the pandemic. Um, and in many locations, especially in the camps that I've been uh, working in, this has seen a significant reduction in the and the um, services that these uh, NGOs would normally provide. And at this pr critical moment, what we've seen is leadership by refugees um, around the camps that I've been working on, and I'm sure across the globe, who have assessed the needs of their communities and have taken um, action directly to address those needs. And as demonstrated by many refugee-led initiatives um, around the globe, uh, refugees are really core actors and have the potential to implement their ideas, to participate in their own solutions on the ground, um, we can engage in meaningful ways by being flexible, being practical and being effective and anticipating and responding to the challenges we face. And really when it comes to issues of displacement, we are experts. Um, 
But what I think is really uh, has been traditionally lacking, although we've seen a lot of movement, is the support of uh, the participation of displaced people in decision making and providing the platform for uh, refugees and displaced people themselves um, it's to take part in the decisions that impact us the most. We've seen over the last few years a really strong move towards supporting and facilitating refugee participation at the local, national, regional, um, and especially at the global uh, level. For example, the formation of key global refugee networks that have taken part at all of these um, high level events. Uh, we've seen uh, the establishment or um, the support of existing um, networks in the regional context. Um, we've seen, for example, the refugee steering uh, group for established for the ATCR, for which I'm serving as one of the representatives. And what we've seen is um, the first global refugee forum, the GRF, benefited from an unprecedented uh, contribution of more than 70 refugee leaders from around the globe. Um, the role of refugees in preparing for and participating in the GRF has really set an important precedent for um, all these different uh, forums in which policies concerning the lives of refugees are discussed. Um, we've seen acknowledgments that refugee engagement contributes to solutions and that uh, solutions that are sustainable, more impactful, more innovative. Um, and we've seen uh, many forms of advocacy in the development of policies that are closer to the reality on the ground. And so, I mean, in summary, to answer your question, um, we've seen uh, a lot of refugee-led initiatives um, and we've got evidence uh, that participation of refugees really uh, helps in terms of uh, more practical solutions that contribute um, to the lives of displaced people. So I think um, it's really you know, long past time for the international community to stop thinking of refugees as beneficiaries um, but rather embrace them for the contributors and essential partners that they are. And as I've mentioned through all these different examples, we are seeing a trend towards refugee voices being heard more. Um, and I think that we just need to continue and strengthen that path uh, to recognize that forcibly displaced people are ready and willing to contribute to developing and implementing solutions um, uh, for, for the challenges that impact them. Let's hope that that does continue, Rez. Thank you very much for your remarks. I'd like to ask each of the speakers uh, another question before turning to audience questions. Um, just in view of the time, I'd ask our panellists to uh, confine their, their remarks just to a few minutes, if that's okay, please. So, Cecilia, I just want to turn back to you. Um, earlier this year, Dame Meg Taylor, who's the Secretary General of the Pacific Islands Forum, said that the COVID-19 public health emergency and its ensuing humanitarian and economic fallout offers us a glimpse of what the global climate change emergency can become if it's left unchecked and if we don't act now. So Cecilia, I just wondered if you could comment on this in light of your own experiences as the Special Rapporteur on the Human Rights of IDPs, especially in view of the fact that last year, three quarters of IDPs moved on account of disasters. Thanks for that. And um, very relevant question to me as well um, in this time of day, because just last month, I my latest report to the General Assembly was on internal displacement, the human rights of IDPs, and the adverse effects of slow onset climate change. And, uh, and also as a member of the uh, platform for disaster displacement, this has always been on the agenda. Um, my agenda, but of course the agenda of the world, in order to really look at the effects of climate change transborder and internally and how this impacts populations. So I, I think it's important to mainstream the, the needs and the human rights of internally displaced persons who have to move and just generally have to move, not just across borders, but internally as well. And we have a lot of tools at our disposal. Unfortunately, those tools like law and policy, executive decisions, um, infrastructure that we need to, um, to, to step up on need to be coupled by the political will of each and every country in the world and at the international level to really style up the work on disaster and risk mitigation. And we need political decisions for that. We will not be able to 
to um, respond to the situation just by technical solutions. So political will internationally and political will of each and every country with the citizens involved would be my short answer to this because we need to, uh, to, to remember that in the end of the day, it's the people who are affected, we are affected, and who knows, we may also need to move someday. Um, and we need to see how we can mitigate that or even prevent that. Thank you. Thanks, Cecilia. And yes, it is a very complex and, and challenging issue. Um, and we'll hear a lot more about it, no doubt. Kathleen, we, something else we hear a lot about is mixed migration flows, um, economic migrants and the like. These can often be simplistic terms that really fail to capture the complexity and dynamics of mobility. So looking ahead, what are the implications of the changing broader migration context for the international protection regime? Thanks, Jane. That's a, it's a challenging question. And uh, I think we can see how challenging it was if we look back to uh, 2016 and the special UN summit on large movements of, of people. Um, in that um, states were unable to agree to deal with refugees and, and non-refugees, refugees and other migrants in, in the same instrument. And I thought that was a real missed opportunity because there isn't a bright line, um, even uh, though there's a, there's a bright legal line between how refugees and other migrants are treated, there isn't a bright line between their motivations um, and between their experiences. And so I'm, I continue to be somewhat disappointed at how little the Global Compact for Migration and the Global Compact for Refugees seem to be converging at the implementation uh, stage, uh, I think there really does need to be much more of a recognition of the um, the the complexity of uh, movements of people and um, the I, I think movements motivated by climate change provide perhaps the best uh, the best example of this and you've you've shown so much of this in your own work, Jane, we, we still tend to talk about this as if it were a problem for the future, uh, when in fact, uh, as we know, it's, it's going on all around us right now. Um, and I think one of the challenges now is to make climate-induced displacement visible um, to, to uh, when we're describing people not just as refugees um, or as economic migrants, but to acknowledge the complexity of the drivers that are um, compelling them to, to leave their homes. That's, that's so true, thank you. Um, Rez, back to you. Uh, I guess I, I wanted to ask you, what sort of durable solutions do you think are needed to enable people who are displaced to reestablish their lives in safety and with dignity? Thanks, Jane. I think um, Louise really highlighted a lot of the solutions and so did Cecilia. Um, I'd just like to want to focus on one that's quite personal for me and one that I've been focusing a lot of my uh, advocacy efforts on, um, as well as the organization that I work with, and that's education. Um, uh, and I think that's really fundamental when it comes to solutions and uh, the future of refugees. Um, children are disproportionately impacted by forced displacement. Um, you know, no child should really pay the cost of conflict by missing out on schooling, yet what we're seeing is generations of children, uh, displaced children, unable to access education. Um, um, education is critical for a number of reasons, but just to, to name a few, um, it can be critical because children can be protected by, uh, from human trafficking, um, from illegal adoption, from child marriage, from sexual exploitation, uh, from forced labour, by simply being um, in a, a classroom environment. Um, and in addition, in conflict and other crises, higher education can serve as a powerful driver uh, for change. It can shelter and protect a critical group of young people uh, by maintaining their hopes for the future. It can foster inclusion and non-discrimination, and it can act as a catalyst for the recovery and rebuilding of post-conflict countries. Um, it, for me personally, in Pakistan, where I was born as a refugee, I was denied an education due to my refugee status. Um, and now I'm a Harvard-educated lawyer fighting for the rights of other refugee youth to have access to education. 
uh, through the organization that I founded, Empower, we've been able to provide workshops and mentoring programs for over 20,000 young people um, across the globe. Um, and this is something that I have, you know, had a lot of passion for because I remember in high school, I was told I should consider other options because law school would be too difficult for someone like me, um, uh, someone like me, a refugee with no history of education in the family. I witnessed my older siblings and uh, members of my community drop out of school uh, for, for various different reasons, but lack of support or pressure to support their family with um, uh, uh, employment and you know financial um, reasons. I heard about my cousins in Kurdistan sharing their dreams of education as they only had sporadic classes when it wasn't too dangerous. I heard the stories of my father literally studying in a cave while bombs were going off um, during the Kurdish genocide and stories of my mother um, who dropped out of uh, school at the age of 10 to become the head of her family after her mother was killed in uh, these chemical attacks as part of the Kurdish genocide. Um, later on in life, I visited a school and a camp in Kenya where one teacher taught 950 students. And in that camp, only 5% of students um, attended secondary school. So all of these, uh, why I uh, founded Empower to address this critical gap of education um, and to change these statistics. Um, we run workshops in, in camps across the globe using innovative ways to access education because there simply aren't enough schools to accommodate all the young people in camps. And so this really shines a light on the need to be innovative um, and think differently about the way we access uh, education as a form of a solution for building the future for refugees. And um, it requires you know, various different programs to be implemented. It requires partnerships across, um, you know, across the spectrum with universities, civil society, uh, businesses, um, private sector, uh, governments, um, and refugee-led organizations themselves to really implement programs which will allow young people um, to access education and quality education. Um, I think education is pivotal to changing the future for displaced people, and there really isn't such a bright future for young people in, in places that are um, suffering or affected by conflict or other crises unless these young people learn today and receive an education that can enable them and provide them with the tools and skills to be empowered to then make a positive change for their community. So um, that's one that I think is a really important um, aspect of solutions which we often overlook when we're just thinking about you know, resettlement or uh, more traditional I guess methods of um, solutions. We, we forget that educating these young people will contribute to so many other aspects um, of their lives and really empower not just this individual, but an entire community. Well, Rez, you're a living example of that. And congratulations on all your achievements. They're just amazing. Louise, I'll turn now to you. And uh, I wanted to ask you what you see as the key future challenges for operational agencies working with displaced people in the decade ahead. Well, Jane, we're not short of challenges. Uh, so <laughs> I'll, actually, I'll point to two um, because they hint at um, what challenges actually offer. And it is that opportunity to rethink a little bit how, how we actually solve problems and, and move ahead. I guess the first one I would call the challenge of the space in which we operate. I mean, we've been saying, well, before uh, this pandemic, we've been saying just how challenging it is for, particularly for operational humanitarian agencies, whether UN or NGOs or, or even community-based organizations to be able to operate safely, but with this purpose of, you know, accessing people. I mean, the, the most gratifying part of my job as for uh, the jobs of uh, so, uh, some of the panelists is that proximity to people. Uh, without proximity to people, you don't have the, the legitimate right to intercede on their behalf when asked. Uh, the solutions uh, to, from big and small problems come from the people you actually ask. Without that proximity, there's a, a huge challenge. And so access to populations has become a, a, 
I think one of the very singular uh, concerns uh, for, for all of us. Cecilia works you know, with and among uh, and for internally displaced people. In a confl active conflict situation, accessing all populations in need in that impartial way is a real challenge for humanitarian agencies who also you know, need to be protecting themselves to be able to, 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 to gain access. Just as the Secretary General just very recently called for a global ceasefire, we've seen many conflicts or um, armed groups actually acknowledging this and making efforts to pause or to create humanitarian corridors to be able to uh, provide access of, you know, of assistance to, to populations in need. But at the same time, as we've seen, for example, the intra-Afghan talks launched by Afghanistan, we've in the last few months have seen an exponential growth in civilian casualties in, in, in Afghanistan. And as we speak, um, you know, there's an escalating new conflict uh, in Ethiopia uh, and a decades long conflict, you know, exacerbated between uh, Azerbaijan and Armenia. And I could go on and on and on. The space to operate um, and doing this with a view to, it's not about picking sides, but it's, it's with that goal of uh, getting access to populations to be able to serve. Um, is a major challenge. And this leads me to the probably the other challenge, which is the opportunity in, in all of this, is the space of others to operate. In the 21st century, you know, um, governments are not the only um, political or power reality. I, um, Cecilia mentioned this and Rez was extremely uh, powerful in describing this but there are many other voices that actually do need to be heard because the solutions lie with them. One thing is the people impacted, IDPs, refugees, and, and gaining from them and providing them obviously with the tools to be able to act with agency. But we recognize more and more the role of so many other actors who've been wanting or have been doing things very subtly in the space of protecting refugees, migrants, and others. Cities, for example. Cities are the local government, uh, some often front line with the challenges of urban poverty, insecurity, et cetera, and oftentimes have the least uh, resources to be able to tackle and innovate in what we expect is their job to innovate and find solutions for displacement within um, their realm. Um, businesses, academics. I mean, we've seen the opportunity here with the Global Compact on Refugees setting up these, you know, four hour groups to be able to bring together all of this knowledge, innovation, capacity, and resources uh, and, and come together around certain problems to be able to, to, um, to tackle these. Again, governments or states can either facilitate or impede. And we've seen this very recently, you know, take either um, the movements through the Mediterranean or very recently in the Andaman Sea. The choice to broker disembarkation for people who've been rescued at sea, if there is a rescue at sea, requires uh, governments and, and, and nations to cooperate, to collaborate. If one country needs to accept disembarkation, other countries can step in and actually provide that comfort of funding, of programs, of also extending resettlement or solutions to the populations who will be found to be in need. These forms of collaboration are actually instigated oftentimes by the voice of others, the pressure brought to bear by businesses, the expectations of communities, the support that community-based organizations can also provide. So the opening up of space in a time where the space to operate for classic actors is shrinking, I think is the, both the challenge, but um, really the opportunity to rethink our own work. Thank you very much, Louise. And that, that leads us into audience questions. We've got 10 minutes remaining and the, uh, the question that has the most votes is one that I think I could pose to all of you. 
um, and that is, do you think it's time to review the international treaties that were written for different times and different challenges so that they focus on displacement more broadly rather than narrower categories? Cecilia, I might ask you to respond first of all, please. Thank you. Uh, being a lawyer myself is one of my favorite subjects indeed. Um, I always say there is no harm in having more treaties that would be more in-depth in terms of protection and broader in terms of scope. But we also have to understand that is this the political solution that we are all trying to look for? And will there be actually political appetite on the part of the UN member states um, to do this? Having said that, it's not really an answer. Um, I think theoretically, yes, but politically and practically, I think it might be a damaging uh, or even a danger. Um, and at this point in time, we do need to find as well probably other solutions that will not necessarily be confined to treaties, for example, that would need negotiations among states who have different vested interests. And secondly, um, where there will be a need for multiple layer of acceptance through signing, ratification, implementation, domestication. We do need international standards that will really answer what you, the problem you're posing. And, and um, no, this is not really an answer um, to be given um, to you. I am, um, if, if you want, flagging all the pros and, and the cons, we do need to think more of it and probably really look for other solutions and not necessarily just confine us to international treaty law making. Thanks, Cecilia. And actually, I guess as I go to the other panellists, there may well be some um, positive practices that you've seen emerging in recent years that you might like to flag that, that could be drawn on if, if you, in fact, agree with Cecilia's okay. assessment. Good. Good. Um, Thank you, Jane. But given very, very uh, brief um, uh, time that we have very quickly, um, I, I launched the Guiding Principles 20 Plan of Action in 2018. And actually, Louise was still in Geneva at the time. And it had, it's closing this year. And we have really found that there are so many good practices on the ground, local, national, and regional. We would really like to encourage more of those practices to be acknowledged, supported, and even spread out. And one of the things that I would like to insist on is that it has to be with the internally displaced persons and not for the internally displaced persons. Thanks, Cecilia. Rez, I'll just turn to you briefly. We've, we've only got a few minutes left. Um, your, your thoughts on, on these issues, please. Um, so on the, the point about the um, good practices, I think it's important to note that there are really good practices um, and rather than reinventing the wheel, what we really need to be doing is reinforcing and replicating good practices that already exist um, globally to address critical gaps and challenges. Um, and as I mentioned, there are already many refugee-led organizations and leaders around the globe who are leading initiatives that have a real impact. The issue really lies in the um, uh, I suppose lack of funding and support that is needed in many situations um, uh, refugee led initiatives tend to be overlooked or underfunded. And so I think it's imp imperative, especially in the post COVID humanitarian response that international NGOs create space for refugee leaders um, to, to take a lead and to tackle the challenges and fill the gaps that they see in their communities to recognize their efforts and support them further. And I think really, I just wanna give an example of um, three ways that we can do that well, uh, to support that. And I think well, firstly, facilitating funding um, without the complicated bureaucracy and, and, and uh, processes that are involved. And um, secondly, enable transparency and accountability in programming to create real partnerships with displaced people. Um, and thirdly, ensuring sustainable partnerships by creating an enabling environment with opportunities for continuous learning and funding so that refugee leaders can continue to develop their capacity um, while leading these uh, uh, initiatives. Um, and when it comes to working in partnership with refugee leaders, I think as an, uh, a huge potential to leverage 
uh, effort and investment, and it is an op uh, opportunity for international humanitarian agencies and, and civil society as a whole to transform how they partner with refugee-led initiatives in order to advance joint efforts, um, you know, both during this global crisis and beyond. And, and what we've seen is that this pandemic has really highlighted more than anything is how interconnected many of our challenges are, how uh, exacerbated the situation is for those that are already vulnerable and marginalized. But importantly, it's shown us that we can't thrive while others are suffering. And the only way uh, forward is to come to the aid of the ultra vulnerable who are the least uh, able to protect themselves and that we need to solidarity to overcome the biggest challenges that we face as a globe. When it comes to the treaty question, I agree with a lot of what Cecilia has said. Um, perhaps it's not necessarily that we need uh, to um, review the specific treaties, but really to look at how we can uh, create um, protection regimes that take into account these challenges that weren't um, at the forefront of the uh, their minds when these treaties were formed, especially in light of climate change. Um, and that's something that we think, uh, I think we really need to take into account when looking at um, the definition of a, of a refugee um, climate change is really important. Thanks, Rez. Well, look, um, in the remaining time, I'm going to have to ask our uh, other two panellists to give a, you know, two sentence answer. So Kathleen, you know, international treaty, yes or no, and are there other good practices we should be drawing on? Well, I think uh, while protection regimes need, certainly need modernising, I think we've had better luck in the last few decades with non-binding instruments with widespread buy-in than with binding treaties with only a handful of ratifications. So I would, um, I would certainly uh, vote for things like the protection protocols uh, associated with the Manson Initiative, the um, Migrants and Countries in Crisis Initiative, the, the Guiding Principles on Internal Displacement. These are the things that I think have really moved the agenda in the past uh, 20 years or so. Thank you very much. And, and Louise, the final word to you. If there are uh, human rights violations across the world, you don't change international uh, human rights treaties. If gender inequality is very difficult to tackle, and if gender equality is difficult to achieve and may not be achieved in our lifetime, I don't think anyone is proposing to actually rewrite what equality needs to look like. Treaties are about implementation, and that is the challenge implementing what it is that we've set out to do based on good practices. And uh, uh, again, uh, Rez, I think, uh, was spot on in pointing to what actually has taken some root or interest and to be able to, to work with. I think the greatest thing going forward is recognizing interconnectedness between human rights, well-being, prosperity. I think the the, the how we're thinking about the economy and sustainability, how we think about our environment, and how we think about the participation of people whose lives actually depend on the decisions that we make and the operations that we set up or the practices that we that that, that we implement. That I think is the uh, the our great challenge, highly achievable. Thank you very much for those reflections, Louise, and to all our panelists. I, I think we really have explored those big issues that we set out to, to do. And your reflections have been so pertinent, uh, insightful, and also stimulating further questions. And indeed, on that note, I would invite everybody to join us for the breakout session that we're going to have via a separate Zoom link, which you can find in uh, the, the chat that has been posted. That will kick off at 12.05 p.m. So there's a, a short break. It will be facilitated by Dr. Mary Ann Lockery. And we hope as many of you will be there as is possible. Once again, thank you to our speakers. Thank you to you, the audience. And we look forward to seeing you at our other conference sessions. <laughs>